grab a seat, grab a seat. Well, I uh, want to thank my dad for giving me the worst session in MFI conference. Um, I don't know who wants to go after Brother Gentile and before lunch. I don't know what I did to offend you. I don't know what I did to make you upset, but I don't think anybody wants to go after Pastor Gentile and before lunch. Um, so stay with me as we, I know you're, you're, uh, you're hungry, you'll get your watch, and I know we all just wanna listen to Pastor uh, Gentile just talk about prayer. I feel convicted, I don't pray whatsoever, apparently. Um, and so after this, I'm gonna go um, uh, pray for a couple days and repent of my sins. Um, Hey, I, I have a clock that's already ticking. I just wanna jump in this morning. Um, it's my honor to be with you, and it's so good to see so many of you. I know last year we were online, and before that, I did a conference, and so it's so good to see so many of you, and it's my honor to be with you this morning. And I just wanna share a few thoughts that's been on my mind and my heart that has greatly encouraged me. Let's go to the book of Hebrews this morning, this afternoon. I am obviously not going to delve into the history of Hebrews. Many of you are much smarter than I, and you know that... Um, the book of Hebrews is a very interesting book. I would say I believe it's the Apostle Paul. You may think it's Luke or whoever. I would venture to say it's the Apostle Paul writing, though we surely don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. But the book of Hebrews was written two to three years before Rome destroyed Jerusalem. They're going through extreme time. They're being killed for following Jesus. They're being murdered. Their business is getting shut down. Their family's being ripped apart. The temple's not active. And Paul, I believe, or the writer of Hebrews, is writing to a church that's been divided, a church that's been scattered, a church that cannot meet together, lead together, see each other. And Paul essentially writes the book of Hebrews on, I would call it the anti-drift book. He's challenging them, do not drift away. Do not leave, do not wander. And if you could kind of put a sense to the book of Hebrews, in my opinion, it's a book about not drifting. It's a book about not wandering, and specifically for these Hebrews, not going back to Judaism, not going back to the old way of thinking. And he writes in Hebrews 12, 12, I'm gonna jump back up to Hebrews 12, 1 in a moment, but I wanna read Hebrews 12, 12, that verse that popped to my mind and my spirit a few months ago in the middle of the world that we find ourselves, and it says this in Hebrews 12, 12, so take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. This afternoon, I wanna just speak from the topic, take a fresh grip. Take a fresh grip. Let's pray as we jump into Hebrews 12. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for our time together. I thank you for this conference and every single person coming from all around the world, different states, cities, churches, coming together as a family. I pray you'd be with us in these moments together as we spend a few moments in your word. Challenge us. Holy Spirit, we ask you to open our ears, open our mind, open our heart right now. In your mighty, mighty name I pray. Everyone said? One thing I've noticed about the Bible is that the Bible is not just a book of precepts, but it's a book of principles. As Christians, we are people of patterns, principles, and precepts. This book, all 66 books, are showing us a pattern to live, principles to live by, and precepts to listen to. And what I love about principles and precepts, in other words, the Bible is a book of this and that. This and that, this and that. In other words, the Bible is a book, if you want that, you must do this. If you wanna live this life, you must do that. It's a book of this or that. What's interesting to me, for myself at least, living in downtown Portland, pastoring a church in downtown Portland with Antifa for the last uh, 18 months, our city was on fire for 181 days. We lived in the church building for a few months as our home was being built, uh, which our building is in the middle of, uh, right next to Lowerhurst Park, where Antifa would meet before they went across the bridge. And so we wake up till at two in the morning with thousands of people surrounding our building with guns and drums and waiting to go across the bridge. My son woke me up, Dad, there's people outside again. That is where our church is, right next to where they'd meet and all the riots and all that stuff going on. It was right in the middle of where our church is. And I found this, at least about my city, I don't know where you live, but for at least for Portland and where I pastor and I live, is that we live in a city that wants that without obeying this. In other words, I've noticed that we have found a church, we found a city, we have found a world, we found a culture that wants godly values without godly, godly doctrine. Have you noticed a lot of the things that the world screams about the Bible written 2,000 years ago? 
a world about justice, a world about values, a world about love, a world about equality, a world about togetherness. It's interesting to me that the world that we live in wants godly values, but we reject godly doctrine. And it's impossible to have godly values without following godly doctrine. In other words, the Bible is a book of this and that. And we cannot divorce them because if we want this, we must follow that. In other words, we must understand that orthodoxy is the defiant resistance against heresy. Orthodoxy is the defiant resistance against cultural heresy. Because we must understand in order to get this, we must listen to that. I love Hebrews 12, 12, because he's writing to a group of Christians and a group of believers, and he, Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, says, take a fresh grip. Take a fresh grip of your tired hands and your weak knees. Now, I don't want to dive too much into this because you all are very aware of uh, typology and, 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 and things in Scripture that give us window into what the words mean, but I love the two words, your tired hands and your weak knees. We know that hands in Scripture represent strength and activity. So what he says at the beginning is, I want you to take a fresh grip with your strength and with your activity. Second thing he says is, I want you to strengthen your weak knees or your legs and knees and feet, where is it where you're going? In other words, Paul is still saying, you have something to do and somewhere to go. I want to remind you today, pastor, you have something to do and you have somewhere to go. And we need to, as leaders and pastors and youth pastors and executive pastors and campus pastors, we need to right now in this moment take a fresh grip of our churches, fresh grip of our vision, fresh grip of our faith, fresh grip of our anointing. We need to take a fresh grip because we still have things to do and places to go. And I don't know if you have tired hands today, but we need to take a fresh grip. I don't know if you have weak knees today, but we need to take a fresh grip because there's things for us to do and places for us to go. But when I read Hebrews 12, 12, it feels a little bit unsensitive, doesn't it? A little bit out of tune, out of tone. We're like, Paul, we're dying here. And you have the audacity to say, suck it up. <laughs> right, you ever like being in practice and you're like exhausted? You're like, run faster! You're like, I can't! Right, you ever tell like a, a depressed person, just be happy! They're like, I, I would if I could. Right? Be stronger. Like, what? It's, it's, Hebrews 12, 12 says a little bit like, okay, we're dying out here. We can't meet in the temple. We're scattered everywhere. And the writer says, take a fresh grip. Every, tired hands or weak knees. I, when I read this, I'm like, Lord, it sounds a little bit insensitive. Like, care for a moment, Lord. <laughs> like, just come down off your holy hill and look at my life a bit. You know, like whenever you, like, you spank your kid, they're crying, stop crying. They're like, you're making me cry. Stop crying, you spank them. Stop crying. Like, this is how I was raised. Um, <laughs> and we're, we're making kids cry while telling them to stop crying. This sounds a little bit repetitive. Uh, and this is what Hebrews 12, 12 sounds like to me. Like, just take a fresh grip. And I, I, a few months ago when the Lord brought this verse, I'm like, Andrew, you need to take a fresh grip. I was like, Lord, do you see the city? What do you mean take a fresh grip? It should be like take a fresh nap is what you should be saying. <laughs> it should be take a rest, son. Just lay down and rest for a bit. It's been a long season for you and Antifa. Just take a break for a bit. <laughs> but no, the Lord was like, take a fresh grip with your tied hands and your weak knees. Why? Because you have things to do and places to go. And I'm like, how do I take a fresh grip? What do you mean? And then he goes like, notice where 1212 starts. It says, so therefore... In other words, 12.12 is the end of Paul rant, not the beginning. And I wanna give you four ideas today how we as leaders and church pastors can take a fresh grip. Number one, look at Hebrews 12.1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge cloud of witnesses to the life of faith. Number one, how do you take a fresh grip? You get surrounded. He starts off with Hebrews 12.1. I wanna remind you, church, I wanna remind you, Christians, you are surrounded. I know you feel distant, I know you can't gather, I know it feels like everyone's distant and you can't gather at the temple, but you are surrounded. And I wanna ask you this morning, as a, from pastor to pastor, leader to leader, are you surrounded by serve members or family members? Because I think too many pastors are only surrounded by serve team members, not family members. What I mean by that is too many pastors don't attend their own church.
I apologize, just giving you some ideas. Why, because Pat, we're, we, we've been hurt so many times, we start stiff arming people that wanna be close to us because the last people that were close to us hurt us. And we only are around our church from a pulpit, not a crowd. And this is why we hide in green rooms. This is why we stop having people over. This is why we stay on the stage. This is why we come in halfway through worship. This is why people can't get close to us. Oh, there's a pastor on staff. Talk to the admin. Talk to brother so-and-so. Meet with prophet so-and-so. Why? Because we have stopped attending our own churches. And I promise you right now, the way forward is not better communicators, it's better shepherds. I promise you. Go listen to Furtick online, go listen to, there's way better preachers than us, okay? If you want better communication, look elsewhere. We can't be in a battle of competing of communication, but we should be in a battle of shepherding because we are not just communicators, we are shepherds. And too many pastors smell like green room and not sheep because we've removed ourselves from our own people. And no wonder we're preaching dry sermons because we don't spend time with our own sheep. And we're merely regurgitating old messages from two years ago because we've removed ourselves from our own church. I wanna ask you today, are you surrounded by family members, not serve members? Actual people coming around you like family that you don't just lead your church, you attend your church. That we're in community, not just in staff meetings. How do I take a fresh grip? You get surrounded. Do you guys remember the story, it's always around Christmas, where Mary and Elizabeth get pregnant? And Mary gets pregnant, she goes to Elizabeth, what's the Bible say? When Mary witnessed Elizabeth, John the Baptist jumped in Elizabeth's stomach. You know what's interesting about leadership? Is whatever you carry, you will find other people that carry the same thing. And when you find other people that carry the same thing as you, what's in you matches what's in them and it jumps in you. That means if you are always carrying bitterness, you always find other people that carry the same thing that you do. If you carry the anger of the political world we live in, you will find another pastor that you just wanna call and go, oh, I, I, I notice we carry the same thing. We witness and bear it, witness with the same thing. And whenever you get around other people that carry the same thing as you, what's in you jumps with what's in them. That is why as leaders, we must be very, very careful. What are you pregnant with? Because whatever you are carrying, you will find another leader that matches what you carry. Well, who are you surrounded by? Are you surrounded? Listen, social media is a liar, by the way. There's some Sundays we post, and I was like, church wasn't that good. That post is a lie. <laughs> church was not that good. Church sucked today. That post lies. And other Sundays, I'm like, church was way better than that post, right? Like, why? Social media is a liar. And if we're not careful, we will be so acquainted with everybody, but known by no one. And we as pastors in this room go, like, oh, I'm surrounded by a crowd. Yeah, like you can be like, I'm surrounded by MFI, I'm surrounded by friends on social media. Cool, you have some followers on your page that DM you and say you're doing great, but do you have anyone that actually knows you? And actually knows your marriage? Because we all know you're smiling on that feed, but what happened before that picture? We all know you're holding the hands on stage to give the vision offering, but what happened on the call right there? Does anyone actually know you? How do I take a fresh grip? Number one, you get surrounded. Let's keep going. We are one verse in. I am my father's son. I am apologizing for that. <laughs> my dad took an hour and a half last night, and I get 26 minutes. So I don't know what's fair. <laughs> you guys, my dad last night pretty much said everything he's been thinking for 18 months, and you just got it. <laughs> And my dad's first five minutes, it was, if you quit, we don't need you, and the vaccine is not the mark of the beast. Have a good night, everyone. Like his opening five minutes was like, just so you know, I've had 18 months thinking about this thing, and I wanna let it all out tonight. It was the best. I was like, my dad does not care at all anymore. He doesn't care whatsoever. You can email him at frankdoesncare.com. Like, he does not care whatsoever anymore, and it's awesome.
<laughs> oh, man. I'm gonna get in trouble for that. Um, I'm not invited to Thanksgiving dinner anymore. Um, number one, how do I take a fresh grip? You get surrounded. Number two, you travel light. So we do this by what? Stripping off every weight and every sin that so easily trips us up. I gotta hurry. Number one, weight. He goes, how do, you, how do you take a fresh grip? You travel light. You take weight off. Many of you that maybe didn't drive here, you flew here. When you went to Alaska, United, Delta, however you flew here on your private jet, let us borrow it. Um, <laughs> however you got, if you flew, what happens when you travel from point A to point B? Your airline host only lets you carry so much weight. Your bag, was it, 55 pounds? I've been traveling like nine years. I don't know, like, what is, whatever the poundage is, 55 pounds? 58, 60, I don't know, whatever it is. Some of you, like, you have like four bags. You need, don't bring that many shoes, okay? You don't, you don't need that many. But what, what is the airline saying? When you're traveling from here to there, you can only take so much with you. You can't bring your entire wardrobe. You can't bring all your shoes, all your clothes, all your, you, have, you can only bring so much with you on this trip. I'm telling you right now, the Holy Spirit as your airline consultant is telling you from here to there, you can't take all that with you. You can't baggage all that, you can't take all that. My question to you, senior pastor, is what needs to stay here before you go there? Because if you're not careful, you will bring everything with you and you will replicate what you wanted to leave. And you're asking the Lord, why is this happening all over again? Because you brought too much with you from then. And we will enter into new seasons that repeat the old season, not because it's not new, it's because we brought the old with us and we replicated what we wanted to leave. What do you need to leave? What baggage are you, that ain't coming with me? What are some people that need to not come? We all, you just thought of that person right now. You know it, like I need to email her and just tell her, God bless you, you should just go on your way. <laughs> what are some people that cannot come right now? What are some attitudes you need to leave in 2021? What's some attitudes in your leadership? What are, what, what are some weights you like, you can't come on this trip? And then he says, some sins. Shouldn't be coming with you either. I know we're all pastors, we don't sin, I know. But you know what's interesting with the word sin? It says, don't want the sins that trip you. My question to you is, what are things you trip on things you don't see. No one trips over things they're staring at. The only things we trip on are things we didn't see our feet were going toward. So my question to you, no wonder pastors keep tripping because they remove themselves from the, from the crowd, from the surroundings. Do you know one of the main reasons why we need to be surrounded is so our friends are going, don't trip. Hey, don't trip, hey, hey, you see that coming? I saw that attitude, I saw that thing with the money, I saw your thing in the marriage, you see your kid, hey, I know you don't see it, be careful. When you remove yourself from community, you invite yourself to trip. And I know we're all pastors, I know we're all leaders, and we don't wanna say we ever sin, but for those of us to be a little more honest with ourselves, the things we are falling over is because we're not bad people, we're isolated people. And that is why sin, sins aren't wakeful, sins are trippy. What, how do I take a fresh grip? You get surrounded. Number two, you travel light. You travel light. Some of you need to shed some weight. You can't take that with you. It's too heavy for the new year. It's too heavy for the new season. What do you need to leave? The third thing, you have to take, you have to fix your focus. How do we do this? By keeping our eyes on Jesus, who is the author, the initiator, and the perfecter of our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now look at this, this should be so encouraging to you. Now seated in the place of honor besides God's throne, think of the hostility he endured from sinful people, and then you won't become weary and give up. I, I just wanna submit to you, I know some of you have like known me since I was a child. You probably changed my diaper. Okay, I, I, I understand. I just want to submit some things to you. Have you ever noticed we're not the first generation to go through pain? Some millennials say the stupidest things in the entire world. Stupid stuff like this. This is the worst place America's ever been in. 
Did you live through World War I? No, you're 14, I didn't think so. Did you live through World War II? No, you're playing Fortnite all night on your mom's couch. I didn't think so. <laughs> Did you live through it? Like, guys, we need to take a step back and go, we're not the first church to go through pain. We're not the first leader to lead through pain. We're not the first church to endure a pandemic. We're the first church to endure difficult times. Oh, wait, the church has lasted through the flu, lasted through World War I, lasted through World War II, lasted through the Depression, lasted through the regime. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. Now that I think about other people's hostility, it gives me hope. Because I'm not the first person to go through this. He, the message says, if you think about Jesus, it will shoot adrenaline in your soul. Not just think through Jesus as a victor, think through the hostility he went through, and it will shoot adrenaline. You know what's so interesting? This is the only time in my entire life that we can all say, we all. Remember last MFI conferences, your church is down and to the left? and you're looking for encouragement, and you find someone who church tripled in the last two months, and you're like, I hate you. <laughs> I was looking for some encouragement, right? Or your city is like going down, but like their city is going up, or their staff is growing, your, why? But this conference is the first time we can all go, you too? Yeah. You had people leave too? You had to fire people too? You had to shut your doors too? You just stare at a camera longer than you wanted to. This is the first time that we're all like. <laughs> and you know what that should do to you? Shoot adrenaline in your soul. How do I travel? How do I, how do I take a fresh grip? I get surrounded. How do I take a fresh grip? I travel light. How do I take a fresh grip? Realize I'm not the only one. I know your mom told you that your entire life, but you're not the only one. <laughs> we gotta take some steps back and go, Oh, other people have endured, I can endure. That is why pastors, we must show our limp because we are telling people you can make it too. Last thing, how do I take a fresh grip? So we're gonna land for a little bit. Don't give in to right now. Thank you. <laughs> Verse seven, as you endure this divine discipline, Remember that God is treating you as his own child. Who ever heard of a child who was never disciplined by its father? Well, welcome to 2021. No kid is. When I was raised, the elders made paddles for my parents to spank me. We had paddles with our name on it that were two inches thick. I would have my name across my butt for a week. And my dad would go, hug me. I'm like, I'm not hugging you after this. Right, this day it's like, Tommy, take a time out. I'm like, I got beat when I was a kid, okay? We need to call CPS. Um, <laughs> if God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his child at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of our father, of our spirits, and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. Verse 11, no discipline is enjoyable while it's lasting. It's painful. But afterward, afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who trained in this way. Did you know that pain endured with Jesus gives you a harvest? Did you know that pain endured through the scriptures and endured correctly gives you a harvest of rightful living? I wonder if COVID was nothing we wanted but everything we needed. My favorite author in the whole world, I named my son after. My son is two weeks old. He's sitting over there with my wife. I'm poor. Um, we can take an offering this morning for me as well. <laughs> my favorite writer of all time is St. Augustine. 
and he says this, that the Lord needs to reorder our disordered loves. Do you know what I think COVID did for senior pastors? Reordered their disordered loves. I think we've loved things that didn't deserve our love. I think we've spent money on things that didn't deserve our money. I think we've spent time talking about things that don't deserve our time. And COVID has reset our ordered loves. Many of us do, would never pray for COVID, never pray for racial riots, would never pray for here in Oregon fires and everything that we've dealt with in the city. But I wonder if it's everything we wanted because it's going to give way to holiness and rightful living. And then what is he going, I'm, I'm done, I'm done. The person can come play so I sound super spiritual. <laughs> what's the next, church, what's the next story he tells? Don't be like Esau. What did Esau do? Esau gave in to this moment. What good is suit for me right now when I'm about to die, give me the birthright. What, in other words, what good is doctrine for me right now? What good is prayer for me right now? What good is discipline for me right now? What good is humility for me right now? And what we've tended to do during COVID is gave into the moment, not thinking about afterward. Afterward. Then we get to Hebrews 12, 12. So therefore, take a fresh grip with your tired hands and your weak knees. How do I take a fresh grip? Get surrounded. Travel light. Fix your focus. And don't give in to right now. Leader, right now is a liar. Don't give in to right now. When was the last time we were proud of decisions we gave in to right now? But afterwards, comes a peaceful harvest of right living. My prayer for you, my prayer for myself, is that at the end of this conference, you take a fresh grip with your tired hands and your weak knees because you have something to do and somewhere to go. And I don't know about you, but I let go a couple times during COVID. What go of giving? I don't know what's gonna be. I can't control it. What go to attendance? I just kind of let go. And the Holy Spirit's bringing back, grab it, take a fresh grip again. I wanna challenge you, church, challenge you leaders, take a fresh grip. Grab a hold again. Grab a hold of vision again. Grab a hold of culture again. Grab a hold of joy again. Grab a hold of hope again. Grab a hold of faith again. Grab a hold of your church again. Grab a hold of your leadership team again. Grab a hold of yourself again. Grab a hold of the word again. It's time for us to lead into the future and how we do that is take a fresh grip with our tired hands and our weak knees. Hebrews 12, 12 is it therefore how do we do this? He tells us how we take a fresh grip. What's after this? Lunch? Right? Don't even pray and dismiss, right? Give it back to you? Yes, sir. I'm gonna pray for you. I don't know about you, but I found myself multiple times during COVID just going, <sighs> trying to catch my breath. I've been the tired hands bend the weak knees, but it's time to take a fresh grip. If that's you today and you walked in with tired hands and you walked in with weak knees, I wanna pray for you. Because I'm believing as you go home, a fresh grip is coming. A fresh grace, a fresh grip of who you are, of your anointing, of your gift, of your preaching, of your leadership, of your church, fresh vision. Fresh grip. If that's you, would you just put your hand up? I'm gonna pray for you. Like, my, my hands are tired. My hands are tired. I, my hands are tired. Maybe my hands aren't tired, but my knees are tired. I don't know where to go. I'm tired. I need a fresh grip. Holy Spirit, I pray right now for every single person lifting their hands, every marriage, every leader, every senior pastor, every youth pastor, every campus pastor. Holy Spirit, we need you now more than ever. God, we are, we are charting into uncharted territory. God, we don't know where to go. We don't know what to do. This is new for all of us. There's no handbook for this. There is no scripture really for this. There, there's nothing that writes about what we're going through right now, but we know you are true. You are faithful. You are consistent. You are near. And God, right now I pray 
pray for every leader with tired hands. God, strengthen their hands right now. Let them take a fresh grip of their vision, of their church, of themselves, of their attitude, of their heart, God. I pray for strengthened knees right now as they catch vision during this conference, as they go home, God. Let us take a fresh Grip, Jesus. Those that have been isolated, let them get surrounded, God. Those that have been carrying burdens, let them travel light, God. Those that need to fix their focus and let us know we are not alone. And for those that have given into right now, give us confidence about the afterword. The afterword that's gonna bring peaceful harvest. In your mighty, mighty name I pray. Everyone said?